You're listening to season two of Teaching Yoga, a podcast by me, Cora Giroux. I was a full-time yoga teacher for over a decade, and during that time, I started out hustling, teaching 15 to 20 group classes a week, and I think you know what that is like. I quickly realized that if I was going to keep teaching, I needed to learn how to do business but not just any business, one that was ethical and aligned with my values, but also supported the lifestyle that I craved. Flash forward to 2014, and I had built a six-figure business for myself running yoga teacher training. In 2016, I partnered with a few other yoga teachers and bought a yoga studio. In 2019, we bought another one. Then at the end of that year, I left the studios and my teacher training business behind to create an online business mentoring yoga teachers. If you want the inside scoop on how I made a reliable living from my craft, I share it all in my new weekly video newsletter called The Practice. Because just like yoga, creating a sustainable business requires consistent, inspired action. And after over a decade of being self-employed, I have a few ideas to share. You can sign up right now for free and get a new video filled with actionable strategies for building a sustainable business in your inbox every single week just by signing up at coragerou.com slash newsletter. It's my mission to remind you that you are not alone. And I hope to be a resource for your life and work on the spiritual path, both in your teaching and your business. But for now, I hope you enjoy the show. And I, I haven't yet, yeah, we had to bet. I'm only here, yeah, you know. If you don't like this music, then don't be listening to it, you know. I'm just a dude that you know. Or something similar if you don't keep it real can Hello, hello, hello and welcome back to another episode of the Teaching Yoga podcast. In today's episode, I talk with M Camellia all about collaboration as a business structure. But before I get into a little bit more about what Em and I speak about in the episode, I just wanted to remind you in case you didn't hear last week that we are now opening up applications for the October and even into 2022 intake of Lost to Launch. In the last couple of weeks, Lost to Launch has been accredited with Yoga Alliance. And if you meet all the requirements in the course, you will be eligible for 50 continuing ed hours with Lost to Launch. We're also calling it Business 101 Yoga Teacher Training. And if you are interested in developing your own business so that you can create something truly sustainable for yourself and your family and you're just getting started, Lost to Launch could be a great program for you. We talk all about how to adopt a business mindset to get really clear on who it is you're serving, your ideal student and why you want to work with them. And then also how to put um, marketing and testing in place so that when you do release a product product or a service, you have a really good sense of how to gauge its success. And hopefully um, you'll have a lot of information already established so that you can create something that you know is wanted and needed for your people. So if that is something you're interested in, we will have a our next intake in October and then in March and August of 2022. We're taking students just on an application basis um, so that we can make sure that we serve exactly the right people in our course. So if you're interested in applying, you can head to the link in the description and you can get that started. We're already reviewing applications for October. So if you're into it, I highly recommend that you get onto that ASAP. Okay. 
So today, fun, especially off the back of last week's episode where Janessa and I speak about conscious capitalism. Today, Em and I talk about an entirely different way of doing business. Um, but before we get into that, let me tell you a little bit about Em. So M. Camellia is an experienced registered yoga teacher, 200 hour and a yoga alliance continuing education provider, (laughs) just like what we do with La Salange. They are a fat, queer, non-binary yoga teacher and accessible advocate in Washington, D.C. Called to create profoundly inclusive spaces for self-inquiry and the inward journey by integrating spiritual teachings and accessible trauma-informed movement practices with the spirit of social justice. M believes that the goal of yoga as of life is collective liberation and in turn challenges contemporary yoga practitioners to dismantle oppressive systems and beliefs within themselves and society at large that hold us all back. They've been called a tour de force of encouraging radical self-love and listed among the top thinkers and activists in the field of body positivity. In addition to teaching group and private yoga classes, M offers workshops that explore queer identity, body image, desire, pleasure, and agency. They champion diversity and equality in the yoga industry as a member of the Yoga and Body Image Coalition leadership team. They continue to serve as an expert advisor on diversity, accessibility, and ethics for Yoga Alliance Standards Review Project and currently work with Accessible Yoga to bring their teacher training and conferences to an ever-growing list of cities internationally. M is described by students as welcoming, intuitive, and adaptively challenging teacher. Peers and mentors describe them as highly knowledgeable in their teaching, dedicated in their personal practice, and committed to their students. M's classes often include functional movement practices alongside more traditional alignment-based postures and flow elements that link breath and body. Okay, so now you know a little bit about who M is. M and I in this podcast talk about their vision for their work in the world, why teaching non-asana centered classes, asana, (laughs) non-asana centered classes and workshops looks like. How having a niche early on allowed M to find work as a teacher, how M's career progressed as a teacher, and how having other yoga related work aside from teaching, can bring more balance and stability into your career. How the Trans Yoga Project started and why M chooses to work outside of traditional hierarchical business structures. What it actually means to be an anti-capitalist business owner, because I was like, how do those things go together? (laughs) But M, you know, gives a really great answer, I think. Tips for creating successful collaborations and why slowing down can help to create a more sustainable business. Okay, I may have read all of that super fast because I have just had a cup of coffee, Um, but I hope you enjoy uh, this conversation with M. Camellia all about collaboration in business. Hey, Em, thank you so much for coming onto the show today. Thank you. I am super excited to have you on the podcast. And just so that our listeners have a bit of an idea about the work you do, could you fill us in on uh, the projects that you're working on currently? And then also like, you know, the vision behind the work you do or what motivates you to be doing this work? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, I'm going to start a little bit with vision, actually, and then I'll talk about my projects. Um, I think I, I've thought a lot about why I became a yoga teacher, why that was of interest to me when I originally did my training. And I think for me, it has a lot to do and had a lot to do with being someone who identifies strongly with being a truth seeker. And I don't think that always uh, existed in kind of a spiritual context for me. Prior to yoga, I was interested in journalism. That's what I went to school for. And so was sort of interested in that, like, dig deep into the facts, figure out what's real, right? But I think over time, I realized that even journalism is not going into the depth of truth that actually fulfills and satisfies me. And it was as I was kind of coming out of that industry that I decided to become a yoga teacher. Um, I had been practicing yoga 
for a while at that point and um, was definitely a spiritual practitioner. I still had this vision of like finding truth for myself, but also like understanding something more about the world and then being able to use that understanding to affect change. And, you know, so since becoming a teacher, I've even sat with like, is this the way that I affect change? Or should I be, you know, a professional organizer or something like that? And ultimately, I come back to, you know, I think this is the best way for me to make change in this moment. I'm happy to talk more about that Mm -hmm. (laughs) later. (laughs) But I think that's the vision, right? The vision is that I have spent a long time in activist communities. I've spent a long time thinking about all of the different ways that um, our systems need to be changed and that human beings are being harmed. Um, but also the ways that they can be uplifted if we sort of get to the root of our being, <laughs> that mm-hmm, kernel mm-hmm. of truth. <laughs> and um, I think we're most effective when we have tools like yoga to do that. And so that is why I do what I do. What I currently do <laughs> is, um, it, I mean, it is, I teach yoga. I am not actually teaching a ton of the sort of standard studio class and not just because of COVID. Um, But uh, I'm really, because the root of what I aim to do, what my vision is with my work, is more along the lines of change making for the benefit of all humanity. Um, And because so much of my experience teaching in those studio environments was about asana and um, really about fitness and bodies um, and not necessarily about the spiritual aspect of the practice. It didn't feel like the best environment for me to be using the tools of yoga to create change. So I have a long history of teaching asana and teaching in studios, Um, a long history. I mean, I've been doing so since um, 2016, but currently I'm doing a lot more um, along the lines of teacher education and also community education, not just yoga teachers, but yoga practitioners, students as well. Um, and that's what I would call even the sort of public facing non-teacher student oriented, um, work that I do is more of a education or discussion or sangha than it is, um, you know, teaching just an asana practice for a studio, if that makes sense. Um, some of my projects currently, my big project, like the big new thing is the Trans Yoga Project, uh, which I started last year with seven other individuals, um, and I'm still working with six of them to cooperate. Um, and so that takes a bunch of time. Um, I also work with Accessible Yoga, leading trainings, um, doing other educational events, and um, also supporting in a staff role. And then um, most of the actual other teaching that I do is for teacher training programs um, or our sort of series workshops or more in-depth workshops rather than ongoing classes at the moment. Cool. Um, So for someone who's also had a history of teaching in studios and then has transitioned away from that, Um, I would just love to know, like, what does that look like when you're saying it's more of like conversation and education and more of like, a, you know, a sangha than an asana specific class? Like if someone were to, um, to come to something that you're putting on, is it like that you do some breath and movement and then sit and like have a community dialogue or like, what does that even look like? Yeah, for sure. I think it looks a lot like what you're describing. Yeah. Um, most of my events, I don't schedule for under two hours. I like to have some time. I certainly do like to use all of the tools, right? So we'll do breath and we'll do movement and we'll get embodied as best we can. Um, and usually I'll proceed that with, you know, in some scenarios, it's a little more like lecture in others. It's a little more like Dharma talk, but like, Um, sharing of my experience with some theme and why I use the tools that I do to embody that theme or that lesson in life. Um, So I'll share a little of myself and we'll do some kind of practice. We'll get grounded. And then frequently I start with some like prompts for consideration. And so we might um, sit for a little bit, 
maybe chat a little bit amongst ourselves as things come up, but also maybe journal, right? Um, or just think in silence for a few minutes and then definitely come back for discussion. And I really personally get a lot out of that because I get to continue learning and honor the part of myself that is student as well as teacher. Um, I don't think that those things can ever be wholly separate. So I like to honor that when I am holding space as well to, to be both teacher and student at the same time and to allow the participants to also you know, share what they have. They have wisdom. They have knowledge that hopefully the tools of yoga that I can offer them are giving them access to. And I really love to see what comes up when people engage in the practice, engage in contemplation, are in community, and then are able to sort of build the lessons together, right? Rather than me coming with a lesson plan and dictating it. Mm -hmm. More collaborative. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, Can I ask another really like practical question for Mm -hmm. my own benefit, but hopefully for all people listening? Mm -hmm. Is this happening in person and like on Zoom or is this, how does that go in terms of like the functionality of it? Um, It was primarily happening in person prior to the pandemic. Um, For the last year or so, I have been a little bit more of like in an incubator phase, um, building the Trans Yoga Project, focusing in a little bit more on the changing demands of the organizations that I serve um, because of the pandemic, you know, moving all of those courses for these organizations online and that sort of thing. Um, big undertaking, of course. Um, so it's been a period of like incubating those projects, getting them out and launched. I haven't been doing as much even workshop teaching, honestly, for the last year or so. But yeah, typically my preference is to have those things in person. I'm excited for the days when we can do that again. Um, <laughs> but certainly I have, um, I have held the space over Zoom and I'm sure that I will again in the future because that's a, uh, an important part of access for me that folks are able to come to things online. And that's just becoming clearer and clearer through the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. Because um, I was like, when I was listening to you talk, I could visualize it in person perfectly. I was like, oh, wow. And then they'd look like that and they'd be doing this. And um and when I was like, does that translate <laughs> onto Zoom? <laughs> but um, yeah, I could see how it definitely could. Um, so the people that listen to this podcast are yoga teachers. And many of them taught for studios, just like you and I have, you know, shared that we did as well, or gyms or, um, you know, basically taught for someone else and were an independent contractor. And then during the pandemic, which happened to lots of different people, not just yoga teachers, but um, they realized that that wasn't as stable and secure as they kind of thought. Um, yeah. And are now trying to figure out how the hell do I do this as a business? Um, because, you know, they might have lost all their income and they're trying to teach their own classes on Zoom or, you know, they're just, they're, they're getting their sea legs about that situation. And from what I've heard in conversation with a lot of yoga teachers going through that is there's not a really good model for how to be a yoga teacher in the world, but also have something that is kind of sustainable, reliable, um, you know, for themselves. We see really famous yoga teachers, like people, you know, who are on the cover of Yoga Journal or who are, you know, pre-pandemic, like selling out festivals and like that sort of thing. But like what, what they've mentioned to me, it'd be like really helpful to know how people actually do this. Cause there's not, it's not like a career path that we can just follow. Um, so I'd love to know a little bit about your story and like what you were doing before you started teaching. You told us a little bit about like studying and, and working in journalism and then like what it looked like at the beginning when you started teaching um, and then how that has sort of progressed to get you to where you are right now. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have to say in first, like part of the reason I've been able to do this and make the transitions that I have is a uh, life circumstance, right? And access to certain resources because I was partnered, um, or because I had, um, you know, I had an employer when I was trying to go full-time with teaching who was willing to 
lay me off so I could collect unemployment while I built a schedule. Um, you know, it's really handy to have those things, but not everybody does. Um, when I was first coming to yoga teaching, I was actually already working in studio spaces. So it's another like instance of me having sort of access to resources that not everybody does, right? That I worked managing a studio already. Um, and I was offered a very large discount on my initial 200 hour training as an employee of that space, um, which I wouldn't have been able to, to do a training at all without that kind of financial uh, support. Um, and they happened to have a couple of like really central teachers who were teaching a lot of their classes um, leave at the same time for various reasons, um, you know, big family moves or other things coming up in their lives and needed teachers kind of in the immediate. And since I already worked there and was um, probably like three quarters of the way through my training program, um, I actually started teaching while I was still in training. <laughs> Um, just out of the circumstance again, right? Like all of these things kind of coming together. Um, that doesn't mean that eventually making a leap into doing this as my full-time job didn't take a lot of time and a lot of changes and a lot of renegotiating, um, how I conceptualize work, um, how I relate to other people in a working context. There's, I have a lot to say about how we work these days. But um, yeah, definitely I was um, teaching yoga a few classes a week up to I think about six classes a week while still working full time, managing um, multiple spaces. And then um, I was just starting to feel very misaligned, um, continuing to work in a sort of hierarchical, traditional business structure at a brick and mortar establishment. I, um, by that time, was not with a partner who was financially supporting me. So I was really unsure that I was going to be able to make the move, but I really just started feeling like I had to, I had to change something. I had to free myself up a little bit to be able to work in environments that actually suited the way that I work best and the way that my brain works best as somebody with ADHD. Um, you know, I, I have a neurodivergent brain and it needs different things and sort of the roles that were assigned and available to me at the time just weren't suiting the way my brain works and I wasn't feeling effective and I wasn't feeling inspired anymore. Um, and so I talked to my boss and I was like, I'm going to need to leave in the next six months, but I'm going to like take some time to try to figure out what it actually looks like for me to leave this job. And luckily they were like, you know what? Like we can lay you off, let you collect a little unemployment, help you find some teaching work, um, you know, and, and you can be done at the end of this month. Um, and I actually was able to build up a schedule quite quickly from there. Um, I'm in the DC area. There's a lot of studios around. Um, and at that time, I was also very interested specifically in the angle of teaching sort of a body positive yoga. Um, that's what like my YTT final project was and something that I was experiencing in a larger body Um recognizing that there just weren't enough classes that felt accessible. Um, so that was something I think almost a little niche novel uh, in a lot of respects that studios um, didn't necessarily have, but uh, maybe we're looking for. And um, I was able to pick up a schedule pretty quickly and start making my money that way. But as I'm sure your listeners, or at least some of them who have tried to teach studio classes for all of their income that, you know, made for a very demanding and exhausting life of, you know, over 20 classes a week at um, probably five different studios around the city, um, which energetically, I don't know how I did it for as long as I did. And I only did it for about a year. <laughs> um, and, you know, within that time had uh, gotten hooked up with accessible yoga and so the way that I've been able to sustain teaching yoga is by also working with 
organizations that are within the yoga community um, and serving in capacities that aren't necessarily direct teaching work, right? I build websites, I write content, I fill other administrative roles to make sure that the work that I really care about gets done, um, you know, but it doesn't mean that I'm always the one leading the training. It doesn't mean I'm always the one at the event. Maybe I am the one administrating registration for the event, um, which has allowed me to have a little bit more security around my income and a little bit clearer um, understanding of what my time looks like, which then opens up the possibilities of what to do with that time and with that reserved energy. And it's really within this context that I started to feel super inspired again. And I'm sure that was in part because I was working with other people and not just trying to build a solo business exclusively, but I was working with other people who were inspiring in and of themselves, um, but who also took on some of the work, right? It wasn't like just me running that business. Other people have a role in this and that frees up brain space. It frees up energy and it frees up time. And that's the time I have used to work on uh, my independent business, to work on the trans yoga project more recently. Um, I'm trying to write a book. Um, that's the time I'm using to try to write a book um, and, and to, you know, have other parts of my life that aren't just being on transit from one class to another <laughs> and maybe, you know, sending a couple text messages to friends here and there when I'm in between classes. Right. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's, um, I think it's so important to see like the behind the scenes of how people make teaching yoga work as a, um, as a source of income, because as you said, and I laughed because I experienced the same thing to, and so many people have teaching full time for studios and gyms. Like you literally are, you know, teaching 15, 20 classes a week and it's, you know, 20 hours of teaching and like 20 hours of being on public transport or being in your car, you know, or like walking from one place to the next. Um, can you share a little bit about the trans yoga project and like what the, what the vision and the purpose of that, um, organization is. And then I would love for you to share, like, you know, you work with yourself and six other teachers at the moment. Um, I've previously been in, in collaborations and partnerships, and it's something that comes up a lot, um, in the teachers club, the group that I run for teachers about, partnership and collaboration and how to do that well. And I would love to know if you've learned any lessons that you'd like to share about how to do collaboration in a way that um, is beneficial for the, for the people involved. For sure. Um, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. wonderful. It's like, you know, it's the best work that I've ever done. And I am the happiest I've ever been with my work life, knowing these people and getting to collaborate with them. And it's work, right? It's hard. Um, the Trans Yoga Project, we um, very informally, uh, eight of us came together um, last August, September, somewhere around that in 2020, um, just to offer a single workshop um, for yoga teachers on Zoom, um, kind of a large panel discussion with some education around, you know, pronouns, other language, um, best practices for yoga studios and teachers, um, a very introductory, like two hour workshop, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in the process of kind of coming together just to design that one, um, and then actually carrying it out, we just vibed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we just realized collectively that we had a lot to offer one another, um, that we all brought sort of different skill sets uh, and different points of view to the table and that what it created when mixed together was really beautiful and also of far more benefit than any one of us could provide on our own. Um, and so we kind of floated the idea of continuing to work together and we started meeting on a weekly basis just to see what that might look like, kind of trying to clarify what our vision might be. You know, why are we coming together? Is it just to offer more of these workshops? Do we want to be involved in different ways? Um, and ultimately, we decided that um, our mission is really uh, like two directional. 
which is to say that we are still doing a lot of teacher education for the yoga community as a whole um, that's really um, geared more towards cisgender folks um, who may not um, have engaged a lot with the transgender community, um, but who are teaching public classes and therefore likely have trans folks coming to those classes, whether they know it or not. Um, you know, some of these skills are just really integral and not everybody has had uh, the opportunity um, or taken the opportunity to explore some of that education. And so we're providing some of that education to a specifically yoga context um, where we can also bring in, you know, the deeply held beliefs that we all hold and share um, and connect yoga to this sort of education in a way that I, I think and I hope is resonant for folks. Um, and then secondly, we are also creating space as we're able for trans folks, specifically trans and non-binary and gender expansive folks to practice yoga, uh, to be in community with other trans folks, um, to kind of be part of conversation, to meet folks um, around the country who teach yoga and even outside of the country. We've got um, several friends in other countries that pop in from time to time. Um, because there are actually a lot more of us out there than we ever knew, but the world is large. And so, you know, we're pretty dispersed and, uh, it's been really beautiful for us to be able to come together and then also to create very trans affirming spaces that are trans led and for trans folks, um, which really, they exist elsewhere, but not necessarily, um, in the, we need more. That's what yeah. I try to say. We need more of them. Um, so that's sort of our mission with this vision of um, not only providing the resource that is yoga to the trans community, you know, and all the benefits that come with that, but then also to bring um, the fluidity and the openness and the uh, mindset that really honors change and transition, which are natural parts of life, um, to the yoga community, right? To bring our own stories of people who really embody that fluidity and that transition and that spirit of change um, and use those narratives and the things that we've learned and the way that we understand binaries, duality, <laughs> some of these very yogic concepts, um, and let that be a, a tool that we offer to the larger yoga community as well. Mm. So that's, that's a really interesting conversation when we think about yoga philosophy, and that is not um, my area of expertise. So um, forgive me if I misstep on anything that I'm about to say and same for the <laughs> listener. But when, when I was learning about yoga philosophy as a teacher and as a student, there, it seemed as though things were kind of put into two camps. Is it a dualistic worldview that this philosophy is coming from? Um, or is it a non-dual uh, point of view where this text or this, this concept or sutra or whatever is it's emanating from? And I hadn't actually thought about the fact <laughs> that <laughs> our world is sort of right now is a dualistic um, uh, worldview, I guess, you know, it's this or that, you know, uh, one or the other male or female. Um, and the trans community is changing that for the better. I would imagine that most people listening would <laughs> think that, um, but I didn't ever connect it to yoga philosophy, which is such a cool and interesting and relevant um, to our conversation topic. And so, I mean, I don't have a question prepared on this because it's not something I thought to bring <laughs> up, but um, would you say a little bit more about that and like how, um, what we learn from the trans community can be integrated with our understanding of yoga philosophy? Definitely. I think there are many connection points we could draw. Um, because, you know, we sort of started this with the, you know, duality discussion. Um, I know that that's something that's pretty 
like debated amongst yoga scholars, yoga teachers, yoga practitioners. Um, I don't know that there's one correct answer. And just personally, I'm only speaking for myself and not necessarily saying this is like, this is what duality is, or this is the answer to whether yoga is dual or non-dual. But where I have personally landed is that we are currently in an experience that is dual. There's Prakriti and Purusha, right? There's this separateness in the way that we are experiencing things. Um, there is hot and cold, right? There is there is yes and no, right? There is all of these like the pairs of of opposites, right? I think that's at least in my translation, what Patanjali phrases it as, the pairs of opposites. Um, and my understanding is that we can actually use those dualities and also use the things that kind of break those dualities, the gray area, to more fully understand what a non-dual existence, what a non-dual state might be. And to me, that's the yoga, right? That's the part where we are trying to unify our understanding, unify with one another, understand that this isn't like my individual life, your individual life, our separate bodies, but that we are all existing on this continuum um, that's not necessarily even linear, that is maybe just one organism or no organism, you know? Um, For me, um, being a non-binary person, um, I don't identify myself as male or female or man or woman um but i identify as someone who is all gender and no gender (laughs) um and coming from this place um having that understanding of myself um before even connecting that to yoga philosophy i think is where my sort of understanding of that philosophy even comes from Hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. it's one of the factors that goes into it that like we construct these binaries, I think, because we are copying the patterns that we are learning from our perception of the world that is dual. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that that is the ultimate reality, right? Um, I think that there is a non-duality to be found within that. And um, I think that trans folks in general are a living embodiment of that. Um, that we can be fluid, that there isn't necessarily a binary, even when that's what we have been taught and raised to believe, even when that's what we think we see, right? Even though we see lightness and darkness, (laughs) maybe there is twilight, right? And maybe that in between is, is closer to reality in the metaphor, right? Um, and so I, I think that that experience personally informs how I understand yogic philosophy. Um, and I think then like the yogic philosophy as I've been taught it also affirms some of that for me and broadens my understanding and takes it out of my personal life context and helps me understand it as it might apply to others and their understanding, which also helps me be in relationship better, right? Be a better teacher, student. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, be a better partner, be a better colleague. Um, yeah, I, I think whenever we think in black and white or binary terms, um, whenever we try to solidify a division, that is precisely when we then open up the possibility of creating a hierarchy. And that is what we have tended to do as humans over time. (laughs) Right. Um, You know, as soon as we perceive a division, we create that division. Mm. Instead of questioning our perception, we take it as truth and we institutionalize it. And things perpetuate and snowball from there into all of these horribly oppressive systems and hierarchies and power structures. Yeah. And so I guess my experience with gender is one where, like, I have been kind of kicked in the butt, so to speak, with the need to question my perception, um, my self-perception, my perception of the world, um, my perception of the things I've been taught and whether or not they're true, my perception of, for instance, journalism as true truth finding, 
versus, you know, maybe needing to be, um, you know, more deeply involved in more of a spiritual truth seeking. <laughs> um, yeah, it's changes. It changes everything <laughs> when you have to question everything. Mm. Seems like it's a catalyst. It was a catalyst um, in your life for reevaluating my words, not yours, the world as you know it, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah, they taking the assumptions that were, you know, so embedded that you didn't, you, I, us, we didn't even know there were assumptions. Um, they were just part of the situation that we were in. Like the fact that, um, journalism is truth seeking, you know, <laughs> that's an assumption that I think that a lot of people are now questioning and, and learning about, um, you know, other forces that are in play in that, in that world. Um, there's so much you've said that I would love to pick up on, but I feel like, I don't know if I'm adept enough in my understanding of yoga <laughs> philosophy to go there. So I'm going to ask a question that is uh, a lot more basic. Um, and that's around bringing it back to, to being in collaboration, because as you've said, you know, when we have these binaries, they often turn into hierarchies and, um, and I've, um, I don't know if you know the work of, uh, Theo Wildcroft, do you know? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, she puts, a a different sort of organizational structure on how like a different way of how things could work, which is more horizontal than hierarchical. Um, and from my very basic understanding, collaboration can, it's not always, but it can be a little bit more in that horizontal, um, kind of lens. And, and, when you're, cause so many yoga teachers I know want to be in collaboration. And I think that it's not something that we just like our teaching yoga as a career, it's not something we have a really good roadmap for, um, about how to be in collaboration. Cause we more so understand the hierarchical structure. That's what we've grown up with. That's what a lot of organizations have. So if there are teachers out there who are considering collaboration, I just got an email from someone, uh, yesterday where they're thinking about creating a yoga teachers co-op in the UK. And what have you learned <laughs> other than it's hard um, <laughs> to work like any tips for working in collaboration if someone's considering that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that it, I, I don't want to just sit here and reiterate that it's hard, but one of the things that I think is hard that maybe I haven't mentioned yet is that transition from the mindset of a hierarchical structure, which is, you know, how we all are conditioned to exist within capitalism and within a white supremacist culture, um, and all of those other constructed hierarchies. Um, if going from that to a truly collaborative mindset, and I think, um, honestly, I think it takes a will to go there. And what I mean by that is like, I think it takes having a real foundational belief, uh, something you hold as a value uh, that makes you really want to invest in collaboration as the way you work. Because once you get started trying to move from hierarchical structures or like being a sole proprietor uh, to working in collaboration, there's a lot that you personally need to start working through and letting go of, right? Because when you work with other people, when there are eight intersecting wills, right? Eight agents um, who work on sharing power rather than creating, you know, a horizontal power structure where one is the boss and everybody else is working underneath them, right? You, um, you have to learn how to work with people in a way that you might not be used to um, and particularly in work environments, right? Like, I, I hope that in your partnerships, in your friendships, what have you, that, um, you know, people aren't creating really imbalanced power dynamics that are undermining your agency, but also that happens all the time in relationship, right? Um, and there are a lot of things that kind of come in as echoes, even with the eight of us who part of why we wanted to stay working together um, was that we shared this value of non-hierarchy, not constructing a hierarchy among people that are inherently just as valuable as one another. Um, 
it comes up all the time. Like we still have to, to um, be vigilant with ourselves and also hold one another accountable to not accidentally recreating the power structures that exist outside of ourselves. And sometimes that takes a lot of humility, um, definitely a lot of willingness to be uh, called in, called out, what have you, but like um, be, uh, yeah, to be lovingly criticized. Um, And uh, if you're not really ready for that to be part of your regular work life, um, it's going to be a challenge, right? Um, Because we're not necessarily used to that. We're also not necessarily used to um, the amount of responsibility that really comes with working horizontally in collaboration with others um, in equitable ways that, um, you know, I think we tend to think about responsibility as being something that, you know, increases with the rung of the ladder you're on at work, right? So if you are the CEO, you have all this responsibility, right? Um, And I I mean, I do think that that is true, right? You're taking on disproportionate amount of power. And uh, I hate to quote Spider-Man, but like with great power (laughs) comes great responsibility. I think Mm -hmm. that's absolutely true. Um, But also if you're working in collaboration vulnerably with other people and you are holding one another to account in the ways that you might come in, recreating oppressive structures from outside of your work together, um, you are responsible for not just your role in that business, not just your like role within that group, but responsible for yourself in a way that you're not responsible in a hierarchical structure where your boss is responsible for your conduct. Your boss is responsible for making sure that whatever you were assigned to do got turned in and put out, right? Um, You are still very much your own boss. So that part of the responsibility doesn't go away, but you also are adding the uh, responsibility to one another and the accountability to one another. And um, I think that some of us, and I include myself in this, um, when we encounter that, um, it's scary. Mm. (laughs) Um, It's also scary to think about the ways that other people, like that you really need other people to be responsible and accountable to you. And so it takes a lot of trust. Um, And I think it also, you know, in terms of sharing power, that also means sharing resources. And so in our case, it's like, I could offer a two hour workshop by myself and charge the same as TYP charges for our events. And um, I could make all of that money myself, right. As an example, or I can offer it in collaboration with, like I said, currently six other people, seven of us total and, you know, divide the proceeds amongst us. And um, I think we get into a scarcity mindset when we think about that kind of collaboration, we think like, well, I'm just going to have to share <laughs> the profits of this business then with these people that I am collaborating with. Um, and of course, that is true. But I think you also, I think we also, because we are in capitalism, because we are in a productivity culture that emphasizes your worth as being what you do with the work, labor that you put in, right? What you produce solely. We tend not to think about all of the value that we get personally and also that like our event attendees, our clients, our students get when we work together. Um, And that's something that I was also saying before, right? That in collaboration, I'm more inspired. In collaboration, I have more time to take on other projects, to do other passion work, to be fulfilled in my life. That is so valuable. And it also doesn't devalue anybody within my collaboration because none of us is being put, you know, lower on a totem pole, excuse me, um, lower on a ladder, like a lower rung on the ladder um, than anybody else. And that is something that I think is really important that we don't exploit one another. (laughs) And ultimately, that's, that's why I can't really work in super hierarchical spaces myself anymore. Like it's not just that I feel like it gives other people too much power over me. Uh, It's also that I find myself now 
having sort of practice collaboration, having my yoga practice and everything that that means to me, um, having my work around um, consent and agency, which is a, a big part of what I've been teaching for the last couple of years. Um, I don't want to have that power over other people either, right? I don't want to coerce people in their work life. Um, and I don't want to take on extra responsibility for other people's, you know, work and conduct that isn't absolutely consensual in both direction. Um, I don't want to be the boss and I don't want to be the subordinate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like another binary, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. When, when you were setting up the trans yoga project, did you, with your collaborators, like spend a significant amount of time getting on the same page? Like after that first workshop that you did, when you were like, oh, maybe this is more than a workshop. Like it might be something that it's not a one-time collaboration. It's a continuous or a continual collaboration. Did you all sit down and say, let's figure out some guidelines or some ways that we are going to all agree upon to do this? Um, Like, was it super intentional of how you set that up? Because it seems like, you know, you might have those um, beliefs and someone else might think they have those values and beliefs, but maybe they haven't thought about it the same way that you have. And then it's on the surface, it looks good. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but then like getting down to the nitty gritty, it's like, oh, we mean something <laughs> different by that term or by that thing. Like, did you get real intentional about it and and clear and explicit? In a lot of ways we did. Um, and also it's been one of those areas of growth for us where we've really needed to keep returning to it and hold one another accountable to it. In part because um, there has been um, such a deficit in this kind of education um, and certainly in kind of organized collaborative ongoing work around it that we started getting requests immediately after our formation for additional events to, um, you know, speak at the accessible yoga conference and to put together additional curriculums um, for continuing education to be part of um, people's two and 300 hour programs Um, we've had a lot of those inquiries and they started coming really quickly. And so this was one of those points in time where like for some of us and, you know, for all of us in our own ways, in different ways, that was very exciting, but it also kind of brought up some of that ingrained capitalistic mindset of production. I can absolutely own that. I was one of those people who was like, we've got to say yes to all of this because Mm -hmm. if we want to (laughs) be... Uh, you know, if we want to be successful, if we want this to be part of a sustainable income, then we have to say yes to everything and build and create a reputation, right? And I needed my collaborators, bless them, to kind of wind me down a little bit and be like, okay, but like we also (laughs) aren't going to be successful, sustain ourselves if we're burnt out. We're not going to be successful and sustain ourselves if we don't have systems and then we end up in conflict instead of in collaboration. you know, all of these things are definitely things that I know on some level, right? And mm-hmm. values that I hold. <laughs> and if I was advising another person, even in that exact moment, um, I would have been like, take your time, <laughs> lay a foundation, <laughs> say no or not yet to all of those <laughs> inquiries, right? Um, which ultimately we all just kind of had to, again, call each other in, be accountable to that. And we did go through a collective uh, visioning process. Um, and, you know, we, we tried to strike a balance, um, sometimes more successfully. And obviously there's a little trial and error going on there for every group, but between doing some, you know, actual, not actual work, it's all actual work, but doing some income, (laughs) um, generating work versus doing our internal work, Um, and we, we did, we had a really long conversation about values over multiple meetings. Um, and we did multiple, um, facilitated exercises by different members of our group to really hone in on what our core values were as individuals. And then to be able to kind of list them independently and then see how they matched up and then have little more clarifying conversation around what that meant to each of us. When we saw a value that we all held um, on that list, we could really talk about how 
does that value then need to be embodied, not just in ourselves and our individual conduct, but by our group's conduct internally? What does that look like when it is codified into a policy or a decision-making model, right? Um, And uh, into what we create as well, right? Into a course. What does it look like when, um, you know, that value of non-hierarchy is built into every facet of what we're doing here together. Um, And that does take a while. And I would recommend to anybody who's looking to work in collaboration to make that a priority um, before you get too excited about starting any project. Not that it's bad to have that excitement coming in, but like before you just start throwing yourself into hours and hours of work (laughs) on generating something to um, really sit down with yourself list your core values, maybe meditate on that, see what else comes up, and then have your collaborators do the same, come together, see what the overlap is, also see what's not overlapping. And maybe you'll find that like, actually, your collaborators really do hold that value, and they just put it in a different term altogether, right? Or that they just, it didn't come to mind when they made their list, and that's totally okay. But um, if there is a true point of conflict, that's good to know in advance and to um, discuss in advance. Um, even if you're all excited about the same theoretical work, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you all want to go about that work in the same way, um, or that you will be aligned in how you all want to make decisions, um, or what you want to prioritize as a group. Um, and I think that that just as my collaborators, you know, reminded me, um, and as I have reminded them from time to time as well, that um, you need to have the group for the group to do any work in the world, right? And that deserves just as much energy as whatever you're trying to produce. I really think like just as much energy. We spend um, parts of our meeting just in practice together. Um, We spend uh, time just being silly with one another Mm -hmm. um, and social with one another and, you know, maintaining relationships just like you would um, in other settings, right? Like your marriage probably isn't going to work if you never invest in keeping that relationship healthy and invigorated, right? And put some energy into it. I think it's the same with business collaborations. Um, And, you know, certainly then that, also is part of the work where you need to be able to maintain those relationships and nourish them while also holding boundaries. (laughs) Um, And, you know, that's like a whole nother topic that uh, we could discuss for a whole nother hour. But um, (laughs) I think what I am ultimately getting to with the collaboration piece though, is that it is a lot of work and sometimes it's a lot of discomfort and getting out of your old patterns But the energy that you put into that is, uh, you know, it is met with the returns that you get from that work. Um, I am, I have throughout my life transitioned from somebody who, you know, felt like everything was too hard and really wanted it all to be a little easier to being somebody who is like, if this isn't challenging something within me, I am not growing. And I want to be growing always. I I want to be sustainably uncomfortable most of the time. Not in a way that's like actually causing harm, but in the growing pains kind of way of like, uh, if I'm not being made uncomfortable, then I am not challenging the deeply ingrained beliefs that I'm holding on to that are holding me back. Like I say, I'm holding on to, but I think they're actually holding on to me. Hmm. Right. Hmm. This is so good. Um, (laughs) And I think what you've shared will be really, really helpful to people considering entering into collaboration because it's, it, as soon as you add more people, it's more complex. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but it's just something that um, does take time and care and consideration. And, you know, one of the lessons that, that you mentioned that I'm also learning is that for something to be sustainable, you probably need to slow down <laughs> and and give yourself time to set up that foundation. Um, and, and it makes inherent sense if it's like, you know, 
you're not going to build something sustainable super rushed and quickly and, and everything. It, it probably would take time to do that. But I think, as you've mentioned, we, ha- we have these ingrained habits and patterns and beliefs that kind of are operating behind the scenes without us even knowing. And it takes another person or a situation or experience to bring that to light for us to um, question it. And is this something that I really want to um, keep? Or is this something that I want to shift or change to something that is more aligned and conscious with what I want to do? And that kind of leads us into the next question I have, which is just something that I have been, you know, ping ponging around in my head for a long time. Um, And that is capitalism and business. So I just for your, um, you know, awareness of where I'm coming from, the listeners already know this, but I, I have been self-employed since I was 23. And um, really figured out that that meant I had a business <laughs> it, when I was like 20, 25 or 26. Um, and that's like 10, 10 years ago. So I have been in this um, working for myself, running my own business. At, at certain points, I owned a few yoga studios. At, at other points, I owned a registered yoga school that was training teachers. Um, and unintentionally, but I'm not mad about it, that uh, foray came into, or that sort of led into me educating teachers on business, which I didn't ever anticipate. I studied psychology in university. I thought that I was not capable of doing business. I, you know, I'm not a numbers person. Um, it's not, it's not where I was naturally drawn to, or felt like my skill set was naturally sort of leaning into, but it, I've landed in this position where I'm teaching people how to run their own businesses and how to understand business and and all of that sort of thing, yoga teachers. And then there's a lot of people right now talking about being anti-capitalist. And part of me understands that because there's a lot of fucked up shit that happens. Like, you know, very, <laughs> very simple, not simple, but very obvious stuff like fast fashion or um, the way large corporations, you know, are exempt from certain legal ramifications so that they can pollute the environment. And, you know, those sorts of things where it's like capitalism gone bad. And you're like, wow, this is a huge problem. But then on the other hand, I'm like, well, I teach business. So am I promoting <laughs> capitalism? <laughs> so the reason why I'm asking, <laughs> asking you this is because I've, I've seen that you like have, you, you've mentioned before that you're anti-capitalist, but you also run your own business. And so I thought you might be a really good person to help me out with this quagmire that I'm currently uh, in. What are your <laughs> thoughts on that? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I do consider myself an anti-capitalist. And I also recognize the reality that I exist within capitalism, that, um, you know, we do not have societal mechanisms in place to provide the even the basic needs to everyone within our society. And, you know, that includes me, right? Nobody is going to hand me food and a house and like the other basic things that I need, nor the things that I want. Um, I wish that were the case for all of us, not just for me, but it, it isn't right now. We don't have the systems and structures in place for that. We have capitalism. And that means that I need to find a way to exist within capitalism and still meet as many of those needs as I can. Um, so I have to make money, right? So do you, <laughs> you know? And so I think honestly, when we talk about this in terms of what we do for a living, um, that means that we need to do the best that we can, right? And we have to understand why we hold the value of of being anti-capitalist. Like what what it is about capitalism that we find, you know, um, abhorrent is the word that comes to mind for me, (laughs) but like, uh, you know, in opposition to our values. And we need to start from that place and say, you know, um, if I, uh, if I didn't exist within this capitalist structure, then I would do this with my time. Right. But since I do, uh, and I need to monetize some of my time through, you know, Pay to labor. Um, here is what I am willing to do. You know, um, these are the services that I'm willing to offer. 
And this is how I am willing to accept an exchange for that service. Because there would be labor, even without capitalism, and there would be exchanges of energy without capitalism. Um, but, you know, the issue with capitalism isn't that there's an exchange of energy. It's that um, there's a, an exploitative exchange, right? Not a willing exchange necessarily, which goes back to the hierarchies, right? That like we um, we build these structures into our businesses of like there's a boss and then there's employees um, and maybe there's several tier of employees, right? And then we assign literal value to that person's time and energy um, in the form of dollars, right? We say, you know, if you are flipping a burger, your hour of life and the energy that you expend in that hour is worth, you know, I don't know what it is everywhere, but like, you know, $7, right? If you um, are, you know, thinking big picture and you are directing an organization in terms of, of overall, um, like, uh, what am I trying to say? Like a vision and, you know, you are a CEO or you are um, a creative director or whatever, like then you, the hour of your life and the energy you're expending within it is worth this very different dollar amount. Um, and in my system of values that, um, I believe are affirmed by yoga, um, and by this practice and by the teachings, um, I don't actually uh, value these different um, functions at different rates of pay, right? Um, everybody is using up an hour of their life if they're working for an hour, you know, <laughs> like that time, like your life, your time on this planet is one of the most like to me, for me, it's like the most valuable thing that I have. Like it is the thing that is actually finite in terms of how I'm experiencing this dual world right now. Right. Like I will die someday. So every moment that I have, um, I want it to be a moment that is fulfilling for me. I want it to be a moment that is, you know, if it's creating movement, it's, aligned with like the the universe the natural mm -hmm. force of change the the things that are unchanging right um i i want it to to be impactful and to mean something and to have value because it is valuable i think that's really what i'm trying to get to is like i know that my time is the most precious thing and having it undervalued in a capitalist society that says like, oh, hey, you um, didn't ever finish college because, um, you know, you couldn't get the proper accommodations because you're disabled, which is my experience, um, you know, because I couldn't finish school, which also should not be our be all end all either. But that's a whole nother point, right? But because I didn't do that, because I couldn't do that in the um, already uh, you know, ableist and oppressive system I was living in. Now your time is somehow worth less than somebody else's, right? I just don't think that that's true. And I don't think that doing things like feeding people, like actual life sustaining, is any less valuable or important than any other job, right? I don't think that um, you know, caring for children or cleaning homes is any less important or like energy expending, certainly, or like valuable. It's a contribution to the whole, the way that any other job is. So I know I've just gone on and on this tangent <laughs> and getting back to your original question, right? Like, I don't ever want to put a dollar value on somebody else's life <laughs> like or even a part of that life I don't want to put a value dollar on a minute of their life and that means that I can't be a boss <laughs> you know like in my system of values I can't be a boss but I do still need 
to exist within capitalism to the point that I can survive. So for me, that means that I work collaboratively. I work in as horizontal a structure as I can. I educate myself about power dynamics and I work with people who are willing to be in sort of that communicative back and forth relationship where we are, um, we are co-teaching and co-learning and co-producing and sharing, uh, you know, the kind of social power, at least insofar as it's within our space to the best of our abilities. We are also sharing the resources that our business has, and then we're sharing any profit that comes in. Um, because we understand that even though, for instance, my role within TYP is working on communications projects and somebody else's role is working on administration, that like, even though out in um, our kind of general economy, right? Like if you went to a hierarchically structured business, I bet your marketing director is making more than your administrative assistant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But like, why? <laughs> both of these take a skill set, a really valuable skill set. They're both integral to running this business. I could market the shit out of our events. And if no one was answering emails, if no one was like taking care of the rosters, like then we still would not be successful. It takes all of us <laughs> to make it work. And so we try to orient ourselves within that collaboration into roles that are fulfilling for us, that use our skill sets that we can opt into. Uh, no one is forced to do a job that they won't voluntarily do. Um, and if we had a role that really needed to be fulfilled and no one in our group was willing to do it, that's when we would probably start looking outside of ourselves. But if we added anybody, they would be a full member collaborator and we would go through a whole process of onboarding and empowering that person with, you know, every single thing we know, all of the context up to date, the recordings of our meetings, if they wanted to watch them, right? Like all of the notes that we've ever taken, all of the final decisions and documentation that we've ever made um, to make sure that they weren't coming into a situation where they had fewer resources by way of not having all of the information that the rest of us have about what we're doing. Yeah. Hmm and what we've decided and how we're operating. And, um, and so in terms of folks, you know, running their own businesses, I don't think business per se is capitalism, right? Like um, doing labor, performing labor w is not inherently capitalistic. Like we still need to do labor in other economic systems or we won't survive. Right. But, it's about the way that you value that labor. And so shifting that mindset, right, to one that is more in line with our value of non-hierarchy, our value um, of that innate um, spirit that is within all of us, that is essentially the same, that is essentially oneness, that is essentially non-dual, maybe, if we want to go there. Like, um, there is no natural hierarchy to that. And, um, and so I'm not going to construct one that's going to devalue, dehumanize the people that I labor with. Um, and that's the difference, right? It doesn't mean you can't have a business. It doesn't mean you can't make money and sustain your life and sustain yourself, uh, sustain your community. It just means that you come to it with a different set of values prioritized. Um, for me, that, you know, definitely looks like horizontal structures. And even where I work in somewhat hierarchical structures, um, which is still the case, you know, in some of the organizations that I work with, there are, um, you know, power structures. But um, what I ask in those situations for my own well-being and for, you know, the accountability of everybody that I work alongside and with is that we communicate about those power structures. And we have, you know, built in time to be in conversation about the ways that, you know, decisions that are coming from folks higher on that ladder um, are actually affecting um, the folks who are not in those decision making roles. Right. And, um, you know, encouraging mechanisms for input from folks who might work you know, for someone else. Um, you know, when I consult with studios, which is part of what I do as well, just some like 
uh, equity consultation in particular. Um, you know, one of the things that I recommend to almost everybody, because almost none of them have an actual system in place to take um, or to, to be in conversation, right, with their teachers, is like, what kind of system, what kind of mechanism can you build into your business? That, you know, if you can't just be general partners with everybody who's teaching, if it's not a co-op or a collective, like, um, how can you at least open the doors of communication and have genuine conversations uh, with your employee or your contractor, your teacher um, as a human being and like without placing a monetary value based on an industry standard and instead saying, you know, because of my spiritual practice, because I am a yogi or a yoga practitioner, like I, I see your inherent value that is the same as mine. And I'm not going to hold power over you that's afforded to me by institutions. Um, and that is not, you know, innately mine to claim. Um, how can you, um, yeah. Do you set regular meetings? And if so, like, do you give that person your full attention? And do you um, have a personal practice that um, helps enable you to take critique, especially from folks that you might be used to seeing as your subordinates, right? Um, you know, can you see that taking critique from the people that you employ is actually um, for everyone's benefit, including yours, that it's going to make your business more sustainable, that it's going to give you less turnover, that it's going to, um, you know, keep your conscience clear of, you know, having exploited or dehumanized the people that are working under you, that when your teachers are happier working for you, that they're going to recommend students come take classes with you right? <laughs> that they are bringing a lot of value to your space and that unilaterally making decisions that impact their finances, that impact how they can share their skills, what they can teach, um, you know, but, you know, that's just going to, um, it's going to reinforce the hierarchies and the power dynamics that um, are the basis of all of the exploitation and oppression that we see in the world. So, you know, especially when I'm talking to studios that are like, you know, we've been in business for 10 years, 20 years. This is always how we've operated. Everybody's a contractor. No, we don't have any mechanisms for having back and forth conversations and including our teachers in major decisions that will impact them. Um, but we really want to attract diversity to the studio. We really want... Um, to make sure that we are aligned with Ahimsa and we're not harming anybody and we're inclusive and we're accessible and, you know, we value equity. I'm like, yes, absolutely. We can talk about ways that you can bring equity into this business in terms of, you know, creating access for students, right? Or making sure that classes are uh, affirming um, and, making sure that your external facing policies, your, your pricing structure for, for folks coming to participate in classes is equitable. Absolutely. And also that's not the only place we need to look right now. We really need to start inside this business with the basic structure that is set up here before you even have a student walk through the door. Um, and not just studios, studio is the example, but if you run, some other kind of yoga business, um, you know, and you are someone who employs other people, you know, I give the same advice that like, before you can start doing the work of de-hierarchizing <laughs> our social structures and making not just yoga accessible and affirming and equitable, but like undoing the systems of oppression in the larger world, which, you know, in that spirit of ahimsa needs to be part of our goal. <laughs> um, you know, before you can do that outside of this structure, you need to look at this structure and you need to uh, make sure that you're not exploiting the folks that you are employing to share a practice that first tenant is non-harm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. It, um, <laughs> it, 
because I've been involved in so many different businesses as a contractor, as a, as a boss, as you know, all these different roles, it, um, it just made me feel like, oh, this isn't a binary either. <laughs> like it's not, it's not an either or situation be, because we are existing, as you said, in a capitalist society. And I don't know enough about economics to know the, alternatives for that and what different societies do and everything um, to speak to that. But but this is a system we're in. I'm in Australia. You're in the States. We're, this is where we're at. So, um, but working within that in a way that um, I guess causes the least harm, right? So it's like, how do you take what you've got and make it as good as it can be. <laughs> that's a reductionist. That's such a reductionist um, idea. But um, it's like, yeah, you, you you can't step out of that system. Like I was like, how do I step out of that system? Like I can't, I need to have a business or or I'll be working for a business. Like it's one of those two things. Um, most likely, most likely. Yeah. And I think it absolutely can be both. I think that Again, like you have to be able to sit with the discomfort, especially as you're forming with like having to shift a whole mindset. But like, you know, uh, we are working on uh, like establishing a more formalized like legal business structure. And, you know, we know that like what really represents our values the closest in terms of structures that exist within capitalism are cooperatives. Um, and so the folks, you know, who are talking about a, a co-op in the UK, like that go for it. I think from my view, you know, and the research that I have done on similar subjects in terms of business structures that can exist right now without like major revolutions to change our economies, right? Um, you know, get as close as you can. Um, I think part of him ahimsa is not just like avoiding causing harm, but working at action harm active harm reduction. Um you know, and so for me, that looks like not just responding when your teachers like actually you're underpaying yeah. me and I can't pay my <laughs> bills. It looks like building that in, like taking the time, even without, um, even before you talk to whoever you employ, to be like, hmm, <laughs> you know, how could I take some of the hierarchy out of my pay structure? How could I take some of the hierarchy out of the policies that we have here? How could I um, really step back? You know, it's the same advice I give teachers in terms of the power dynamic in a class uh, with your students, right? Like do less of what you think of as teaching <laughs> is my primary advice, um, you know, and work on holding uh, space for everyone's humanity and everyone's, you know, different experience of being human and everybody's different experience in their own body. Like, there is no way for you to know somebody else's experience or body, really, you know, um, you can see what's on the surface and that's it. And that's not enough. So, you know, I think we, we give ourselves too much power when we believe we have expertise about other people's bodies um, and know what's best for them. Um, I think, you know, we can absolutely share what we know. Um, with students who are seeking that but there are ways to do so that don't disempower students or or per perpetuate that same like teacher over student boss over employee kind of hierarchy mm. um and i feel like i could talk to you all day and <laughs> uh, i probably could but i want to be respectful <laughs> of your time especially because i know you've got something else you've got to be at shortly um so I would love to ask you just one last question, which you can take in a totally like, you know, serious and deep and meaningful kind of way, or it can be totally lighthearted. Just go with whatever strikes you <laughs> as your sort of first thought. Um, but could you finish this sentence? If you really knew me, you would know. If you really knew me, you would know that puns are my love language. What? What is your love language? <laughs> puns puns oh my god mm -hmm. <laughs> yes do you have like a like a catalog that you've saved or people sending them to you and like <laughs> anything like that like do you have like a pun library oh 
I don't have a pun library per se. I just know that like I that is the way my brain likes to work with language and <laughs> I find even the worst puns to be hysterical yes. most of the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I will go to very, very far away stretches <laughs> to uh, find a pun where really one should probably not exist. But right. I'm going to make it exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's so that's, that's amazing. One of my really good friends also um, is very much into puns and uh, she's an artist. And for a while she was drawing birthday cards. So every time anybody had a birthday, she would draw a birthday card with a pun, like an image and a pun on the front of it. <laughs> um, and everyone was very pleased <laughs> because it's like, it's, I don't know. It's like the sim, it's like a very simple pleasure that is nothing but good feelings somehow. Like, I don't know why, but it's, um, <laughs> super enjoyable. Okay. This is great. Puns are your love language. Um, if any any cool puns cross my path, I will be sure to send them your way. And um, I have a feeling all of our listeners will now do the same thing. Um, so before we wrap up, could you just tell folks where they can find you? Like if they want to go to your website or your social media or learn more about the Trends Yoga Project, where do they actually go? Yes. Um, well, you can find me individually at foundspaceyoga.com. Um, and I'm also found space yoga on Instagram, so you can connect with me there. And then the trans yoga project is trans yoga project.com. We're also on Instagram with that handle. And, um, we're also on Patreon. So that's patreon.com slash trans yoga. Mm. I just had someone ask me some questions about Patreon. I'll hit you up on how that's going okay. in a different conversation. Um, but thank you so much for sharing. I think that um, collaboration is something that people are super interested in. And the work that you're doing with Trans Yoga Project, you know, your vision behind that work is, you know, I don't have to tell you this, but like so needed and super important. And that you're doing that work in a collaborative, non-hierarchical fashion is like the icing on the cake. <laughs> it's so cool. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for sharing. Um, and I just really appreciate your time, Em. Thanks for being here. Thank you. It was fun. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Teaching Yoga Podcast. If you want to stay connected between shows, make sure you join my weekly video newsletter, The Practice, at CoraGeroux.com slash newsletter. If you don't keep it real, then you go somewhere but here, cause you know we're only losing control just for a minute. Oh. If you don't like this music, then don't be listening to it. You know I'm just a dude that you know, or something similar. If you don't keep it real, can you go somewhere but here, cause you know we're only losing control just for a minute. Oh. oh. Uh-oh, 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 yeah.